Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Method Ministries. I'm your host, Lucas Curcio, and joining us for the second time, uh, it's a great honor to have author and pastor as well, Michael Ir uh, Irving. Um, did I pronounce your last name right? Yes, I did, Irving. I was looking at your book over here that I have. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, my surname is an old Scottish name, so you'll see variations of people who move here. Irving, Irvin, spelled differently, but um, Irvin. Okay. And I do, like I said, the first time we had you on to talk about your book, 1,000 Years with Jesus, he is a premillennialist, and I see to the uh, right of your shoulder, you got your second new book out, The Divine Message. Uh, yes, this is The Divine Messenger. It's about Old Testament appearances of the pre-incarnate Son of God. Wow, that was a, a probably a deep dive dive for, you know to do that book. I bet. Oh yeah, yeah. For for eighty three thousand words, it's very, I want to say, compact. So you get a lot of bang for your buck. I'm not insulting authors like this, but I'm no Max Lucado. I can't just go on and on. So I, I give you some information <laughs> and we just move on. So you get a lot in that book. Yeah, I don't know how people find the time to write so many books, like writing one book is, is big enough. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I can't imagine, you know, some of these people just are such, you know, prolific authors. It's like they're getting a book out every six months. It seems it makes, it really makes you wonder because I can tell you, Lucas, this, this book is a hint about what I'm working on now. It's a, a rabbinic commentary on Zachariah. Cause I'm working on my own commentary on Zachariah and I'm in, oh. I'm in verse 17. I'm finishing up chapter one, verse 17 and it's 15,000 words. And I'm trying not to be too wordy. So I'm looking at this and going, I, I've, I've spent so much time doing the research, trying to word things correctly. I don't know how people do it, how they get it out so quickly. I've got other we I've got other work to do too. Oh yeah, I know absolutely. Like I don't know if you read, um, ever ever come in contact with G.K. Beale's commentary on Revelation? Yeah, yeah. And that thing is just so meticulous, and it's thousands and thousands of words. I'm like, how long did this guy? study and take the time to write this book and i just man it's like you know i can't i wish i had that time honestly because i eventually hopefully lord willing want to get into some books but between family work and even podcasting i'm like yeah. oh man i just don't have that energy otherwise i'd be just be feel like just coming home at five, you know five o'clock and being being on my laptop till 11 at night you know typing away uh, it can feel like that i gotta tell you i think this will take five years minimum and it's just zachariah that's 14 chapters there's yes. just so much to say. You don't think about when you're just reading it. But if you're trying to provide all the information, all the different uh, Jewish concepts, Christian concepts, provide the right one, It's it can be quite a bit. Uh, well, I'm glad that you're doing that because I feel like Zachariah is never talked about, never even debated about when we talk about eschatology and in relation to, to Israel. Because you can really see how premillennialism connects and interprets that consistently and how Zechariah even goes into like Romans 11, which what, you know, we're going to look at today, even goes into Revelation 19 and 20. And nobody really touches, uh, touches on that. I don't even think a lot of people are actually aware of how explicit premillennialism is from Zechariah, what is it, chapter 12 through 14, where the nations surround Israel in the future, Christ comes, he destroys them, and then he rules. And then you even have this intermediate period where, the, where there seems to be some kind of, uh, you know, sin possibly going on and Christ is right, putting, right. you know, punishing them. Well, it's like, well, when is this, what qualifies for this period? As you mentioned in this book, actually, like we have passages like that where nothing else can, can, can really account for that other than premillennialism. Right. That's the only consistent way I know to interpret a lot of these passages. In fact, I would even say with Zechariah, even his first eight night visions, yes, they have some sort of application to his present day and the near future. But even then, if you take them literally, they can only be fulfilled in the future. And I think that's kind of a typical thing you see with the prophets, but Zechariah especially, it seems like that whole book, he's just got one foot in his present world and one foot in the future a little bit. And I like those blurry lines. It makes it for a fascinating read. Yes, yes, um, definitely. So uh, just to get, you know, rolling on this. So we're going to talk about, I was pulling up a tweet that I, that I said, because I think it's relevant to this, this okay. uh, topic. Uh, Michael and I both agree that Israel is God's people. And we do that because we're convicted based upon the word of God. And so we want to show you what we believe is a, a fantastic passage for showing this in, in, in clear A to Z, you know, fashion, where it's like, I don't even know how how much clearer the apostle Paul God could have been to say what he wanted to say in Romans 11. And, as, and I was telling Michael pre-show, I talked to people who have so many objections to this 
And I feel like I'm, I'm dealing with the same interlocutors that the Apostle Paul was. And I'm just trying to get them to read it to, and to see that Paul actually answered your objection. And, and would you agree with me, Michael, that the primary objection that we really deal with is not an exegesis of like Romans 11, but it's a presupposition that um, God cannot be in covenant with Israel and they cannot be his people because Israel is sinful. And so this presupposition will, won't even allow them to consider that two things can be true at the same time, right, right. where Israel can be sinful and, and even at the present moment as a whole, not, not accepting their Messiah, not believing, yet still covenantally God's people. And what I always deal with is that, is that presupposition that because they're sinners, therefore this can't be true. And again, it's just completely dismissed. And so Romans 11, you know, whatever it teaches to them, it in no way can teach this and they, and they won't even accept it and won't even deal with the exegesis. Is that, is that something that you find similar? Right. I think that's fair. There's just a tendency to read it and say, well, they reject Jesus. Therefore, they have no covenant promises which apply to them. Even though Paul goes out of his way to call them enemies of the gospel, yet the covenant promises still apply to them. Yeah. <laughs> so I... I I've actually argued with people and they said, no, that, that's not talking about unbelieving Jews. And I go, they're called enemies of the gospel. Who do you think he's talking about? I mean, he yes. has pretty harsh language. So he's, I think another problem some people have, and this is people in good faith, by the way, they think the covenant to be in the covenant promises, to have covenant promises apply, mean that they have eternal life, that they've been saved yes. by the blood of the lamb. And in no way is Paul saying that. And you and I aren't saying that. We're saying there are other covenant promises which do apply. Two, I I can think of offhand. Um, one, that the promised land belongs to them. Now, does that mean they always get to enjoy it? No. A lot of that has to do with obedience or God's grace. But two, that they will continue in, perp in perpetuity as a people. Surely that's true. And he has prophetic promises that apply such as in the future when a final generation of Israel will believe in the Messiah, Jesus, and he'll return. Now, they'd have to be in disbelief for that to happen. So we're yeah. right on track, prophetically speaking. And and just to whet your appetite, you know, for the audience, because, uh, you know, you said the verse I was, I was you know, going to quote as a spoiler alert. Paul says in Romans eleven twenty eight, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, Israel's are enemies. That's definitely literal Israel because, you know, Christians aren't enemies. Right. For your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice or God's election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, and the fathers are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right. So, again, two things can be true at the same time. They can be sinners, unsaved, enemies of the gospel, yet at the same time, belo uh, beloved for the sake of, of the fathers. And the problem is the the people who reject this, they'll take the first part, right? Like like a Paul was a your modern day post mill preterist. He would say, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, and just stop right there. Yeah, yeah. But if Paul believed the Old Testament promises continued and will be fulfilled, he would go on to say, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And we can't just take one, cut it off right there, and say, nope, this is it, and you know nothing else. Case closed. When Paul says both are true and it's not this either or fallacy and, and people can't think um, um i've been mentioning this lately people can't think categorically you know they they always assume that this means like they're automatically saved and we're teaching this and they can't do no wrong and right. even right. even like if if the state of israel politically makes a uh or has you know sin and and problems that we're just in support of this and just want to you know give them a pass on absolutely everything and i'm like who, who who's saying that did paul say that in his day or did paul say both Right. And that's just a biblical case and the truth for it. Right. I think some people are straw manning us where they're trying to say, hey, this is what they believe and this is wrong. So don't listen to anything else I have to say. I think other people just genuinely, um, I don't even want to insult them, but they're not really trying to understand our arguments. They're trying to understand what Paul's saying. They just go, nah, Jews are unbelievers. God's done with them. Well, yeah. it, it matters on what you mean. Of course, you need to trust in Jesus to be saved. But God does all sorts of things for people groups based on different promises. I mean, I still think promises to Ishmael's descendants apply because God made promises. So does that mean I think they're saved? No, <laughs> by default. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. I think, I think it might have been you who said this one time on Twitter. It was a little while back. Uh, I saw somebody say that. They don't accept, um, and I'm going to mention preterism again because they're the, they're like the top dogs who are really pushing this agenda. 
Um, they accept the the promises of God to Israel in terms of judgment or literal. Yes. But then they reject the blessings. And how how inconsistent is that? So what? So why do the judgments apply to them physically, literally, but the blessings don't? You know, oh, that's just out the window. Like, what's going on over here? Like, when you know, when would those blessings ever ever apply to them? But you know, they'll uh, they'll tell you all day long again. Like Israel, like Romans eleven twenty eight, they'll have the first half. They have no problem saying their enemies, but they just don't want to accept that you know the second half. And this is what we're trying to point out that Paul again. Look at Romans eleven. Look at Romans eleven. Yes. So I have a friend, he's a Messianic Jewish teacher. His, mate, his name is Model Balliston. He's sort of well-known okay. in the Messianic Jewish community. And he puts it this way. He says, I read a lot of some of these commentaries, some of these um, supersessionist commentaries in the Old Testament. And whenever it mentions Jews in a positive light, they go, that's really actually the church. That's the people of God, which is us. And he says, and whenever it mentions the Jews or Israel in a negative light, he goes, that's the Jews. That he says that's yeah. what, that they all that's the typical of Jews. So yeah, you're reading it through this extremely biased lens. And you know, on that note, I think fundamentally it comes down to the question of how is the word Israel used in the Bible? Is the word Israel ever used clearly, unambiguously, of a Gentile? No. I can't think of any. I can think of four ways in which it's used. It's used as a new name for Jacob. So uh, he's named that in that context because he wrestles with God, Israel, uh, one who strives with God. Later, he's called that probably because he's God's prince. He's God's warrior. Then we see that it is re it refers to the physical descendants of Jacob, the people of Israel, Israel as a whole, Israelites, so on. Then it's used of the northern kingdom after the civil war in contradistinction to the southern kingdom of Judah. But that's not to say the people of Judah aren't Israel. It's just using contradistinction to let us know who's talking about. And then finally, in Isaiah 49, 3, it's used of the Messiah because he is the ultimate representation of the nation and he represents the nation. And really, that goes into why he dies for the nation. So those are the only four ways in which I know Scripture uses it, including the New Testament. And anyone listening to this, yes, I know about Galatians 6, 16. I know all about it. And I think you misunderstand it. But how would you, uh, you know, because, yeah, I was thinking about that, too, if you want to touch upon this, because, you know, we can even, you know, jump back real quick to Romans 11, because really, you know, we're just trying to teach, you know, draw this out, because we think, um, or I think Romans 11 is like a home base. And yeah. what Paul is teaching here is the accumulation of the Old Testament, like Paul's not teaching anything new. And you can even see that how he he draws in their future sal salvation to the new covenant. So he's just and, and, and Paul taught this himself too, like, you know, hey guys, I'm not teaching anything new. I'm just teaching right. what the prophet said. Yes. And so, so this isn't, you know, Christianity is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It's not, you know, abrogating it, putting it aside. And now we just got to, you know, cut it off and just start in Matthew and, through, and go through Revelation. No, it fulfills the 39 books of the Old Testament. Right. So anything like Galatians 6.16, any passage like that, I think it basically relates to Romans 9, 6, which leads into Romans 11. R really, Romans 9 through 11 are sort of one argument, and 11 is the culmination of 9 and 10. But in 9, 6, Paul makes this distinction of an Israel sort of within Israel, and not all of Israel is in this more perfect Israel. And so he seems to be saying there's an, a group of Jewish people who believe the gospel and trust in Jesus, and they are sort of the ultimate true Israel, right? Because they're following God, they're following the Messiah as they should. And they're within this other category of just descendants of Jacob. And so it seems to me that in Galatians 6, 16, he's after criticizing Judaizers, he has to make a very specific point because he's going hard after Judaizers. So at the end he goes, hey, and I'm paraphrasing, but blessed are those who follow this rule, sola fide, salvation through faith alone. He says, and the Israel of God, meaning, Believing Jews, I'm not criticizing you. I'm criticizing the Judaizers. I'm criticizing the people believing in works righteousness, not on you. And so he's yeah. not using that as another name for the church. He's saying, but believing Jews, we've got no issue, no criticism. Yeah. Um, just to give another book, too, that I just read recently by Michael Vlock, Has the Church yeah. Replaced Israel. This is a really good book. He even goes into the history and different models of uh supersessionism or replacement theology. I know I know they don't like that term replacement theology, but just because it's common and people know what we're talking about. Um, but let me just say this on on this note, because another issue or presupposition really is that people 
um, when uh, when they hear this, they automatically assume this is purely a dispensational argument. So I'm not a dispensationalist. It's fine if you are. I don't think you're heretics. I hate it when people say it, it's um, you know uh, you know uh, heresy and whatnot. Sure. But you know, my point is that if you look at like most 17th, 18th century commentators, Protestants, even post mills, you know, uh, you know Puritan post millennialism, which is ironic because a lot of these post mills who are preterists, they don't want to believe this, but their ancestors or the the true post mill tradition accepted Romans 11. That this would that Israel's conversion would inaugurate the millennial kingdom, and they did interpret this to be speaking of national uh, Israel. So, even if you're not a dispensationalist, you you should still accept this because I believe that this is the exegesis of God's word, and th- thousands of men have done this. Like even even George Eldon Ladd, who is an historical premillennialist, he uh, he in his um, it was a book, The Meaning of Millennial: Three Views, and he got to Romans 11, and he called Israel uh, in Romans 11 God's people. And again, it doesn't mean they're saved, but in a covenantal sense, the same way it was in the Old Testament sense, where they were God's people, it didn't mean everybody was saved. It just means they were in covenant with God. And so, yeah. the, the you know, Israel today is still qualifying for that. God hasn't obligated those promises. He said he won't. They're God's people. So regardless of your dispensationalist, I don't want people to just think, oh, dispensational, I'm going to reject that because people are so bent on anti-dispensationalism where they're just going to reject God's truth because they think that anything that agrees, like God forbid you agree with dispensationalism, right? It's that, you know, dispensational has, has nothing true, right, in it. And anything that that sounds, uh, you know, like dispensationalism is going to automatically exclude it. Well, then you're going to miss out on God's word. And I think a lot of people are doing that because they're, they're so bent towards, again, once more, this anti-dispensationalism where they're just going to have these pre- presuppositions and not accept God's word. Right. And yet they would look up to J.C. Ryle and Charles Spurgeon as heroes of theirs, but he would not. They would not agree on this whatsoever. They were. Um, yeah. I think Spurgeon said something along the lines of, "I'm just going off memory," that he said when we look through the Old Testament, if there's anything clear, it's this that God has promises that still apply to the. He says the actual children of Jacob, the actual children of Israel. It seems undeniable that that's the case if you just read it in any normal way without superimposing some outside idea on the text. Yeah, definitely. Just before we get into the uh, little bit of the exegesis, so uh, Thomas Koch, who was one of the first bis- bishops in Methodism, um, he he was in line with classical Protestantism, that Romans 11 is national Israel. And his commentary says this on verse 15, which I think is really well put. He goes, by which we m- may understand that the future glory of the church, again, he's a post-millennialist, when this great event of the restoration of the Jews shall take place, will be so much more glorious in its present state as to appear to the people of God like a life from the dead. Numberless prophecies of the Old Testament, he's, so he's speaking of the Old Testament now, numberless prophecies of the Old Testament evidently refer to this event and the wonderful preservation of the Jews as a distinct people not only leaves a possibility, but encourages our strong hope for it. When it shall be accomplished, it will be so unparalleled as necessarily to excite a general attention and to fix upon men's minds such an almost irresistible demonstration, both of the Old and New Testament revelation, as will probably captivate the minds of many thousand of deists in countries professedly Christian, of whom under such corrupt establishments as generally prevail. There will be, of course, increasing multitudes. And I'll just finish with this. He says, nor will this only captivate their understanding, but will have the greatest tendency through grace to awaken a sense of true religion in the hearts. And this will be a means of propagating the gospel. And just to translate that, you know, what he's saying is God fulfilling both his Old and New Testament, saying what he said about Israel, doing what he said he will do is going to be a demonstration of that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a true God. And this will overflow into, into the world. Now he's, he's a post-millennial, so he believes that will inaugurate the kingdom. But I believe... Um, I, I don't know if you agree with me, but I believe when Jesus returns, they'll see him descending and, you know, they'll call upon uh, their savior, their Messiah, accept him. And then Christ will rule from Jerusalem over all the world for a thousand years. I don't know if you agree with me on that timing, but regardless, this is in, you know, a re- uh, relation to, to that millennial period in, in some sense. Right. So I think when Jesus says, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he's talking to the nation of Israel. I think that word until is very important because in um, Acts 3, Peter's sermon, he says, look, brethren, you acted in ignorance, 
But you know what? Here's the good news. Jesus is sitting in heaven right now. He's waiting for you as a nation to accept him and believe on him. And he will return from heaven and he will bring about all that the prophets promised. So, yes, I do believe when we see life from the dead, that it, when Israel believes as a nation, all Israel, as the Old Testament would say, and Romans 11, then at that point, we'll see the prophecies come about, which, of course, would include the resurrection. So, yes, yeah. I, I don't even I don't take this as just flowery language of it'll be like life from the dead. Yes, they get to have eternal life. But I, I, I believe he means the prophetic resurrection of the dead. Well, and wouldn't it be so ironic that the people today, I don't know if you heard a lot of people, um, you know, we're talking you know, pre-show, but just to fill the audiences, a lot of people today are trying to say that the Jews today are not the same Jews of the Old Testament. And you, and somehow you can just prove this, and this is just common fact by their DNA, as if, <laughs> one, they've got all the DNA of Jews that exists, exists, exists currently and somehow can prove this concisely through some kind of data. I mean, it's just a total conspiracy theory. But I think it's going to be so ironic that those people one day when uh, when Jesus actually does what he says he does to uh, and will do to Israel, you know, what are they going to say on that day? Like They're going to be wrong. Oh, they actually were the Jews. Oh, God actually was talking about them. Oh, God actually didn't put away his promises. Like all these things, like how many times does God have to say this? But it's going to be ironic that the people that they hate, because a lot of people hate the Jews, the people that they hate, these are the people that God is going to use to bring in the millennial kingdom reign. And these, you know, these are the people that have relevance to the end time prophecy. I think it's, I think there's, there's such a great irony, and, and I genuinely look forward to that day where Christ, as Thomas Koch says, will be a demonstration of both Old and New Testament prophecies of God. Right. Yeah. I, amen. Yeah. It's, it's ironic that people say the Jews are bad. They reject Jesus. They rejected him back then, and they have no right to the land anymore. Oh, but by the way, they're not real Jews. Well, which is it? If they're not really, yeah. Jews, they didn't, they're not the people who rejected Jesus. So just make up your mind. I, you know what? I come across that same argument too, because they say, oh, it's the Jews fault. But then also they're saying, oh, they're not real Jews. Right. So, so who is it then? Yeah. And, and you're right to point that out. They say, oh, they don't, you know, they rejected Christ, but you, but you're, but you're telling me these aren't Jews. Right. So, you know, this makes no sense. And this is, you know, really in, in response to this crazy conspiracy theory, I think they're playing the only card they can get because how do you explain the nation of Israel existing? Right. Well, you have to to deny that they're legitimate. But really, the answer to this is it, it should be exegesis. It should be the scriptures because yes. if Israel is spoken in Romans eleven as future, this is going to happen in the future. And if God promises haven't been uh, you know put aside then the exegesis of Romans 11 would prove to the contrary of these preterists who are trying to say they're not legitimate Jews. It would, it would just mean they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong, and the standard would be God's holy word. And whatever data they're, they're trying to throw at you, which everybody has data, by the way. You know, everybody has data for everything. And by the way, i never even seen this data that they talked about. Yeah, but they're, regardless, they're, I'm going to go with the word of God. They're, they're definitely wrong because actually they've had DNA tests quite consistently some have even showed relations to uh, skeletons of buried Levite priests. So these are, I don't know what they mean, what data. Actually, they prove the opposite of the, Kaz, the Khazar theory that they like to bring up, which is just wholesale made up. And even if it was true, let's just say the scenario that brought us was true. But then how did all the other lines of Jewish blood die off in the world? And they were the only ones that survived and then had a, took on the name Jews. It, it just... It doesn't fit at all. I mean, these family names, Cohen, though, that those don't come out of nowhere. I mean, these, these things have been established, we know, throughout history. We can see a pretty good record of history ever since the exile of some Jewish presence, even in the land, even since then. So it, they just posit these lies, and people just believe them, unfortunately. Well, you know what's funny? Um this is actually the same argument that the Nazis used to deny Jesus was a Jew. Yes. So one of the prevailing arguments was that Jesus was from Galilee, and because there was an 8th century dispersion, their DNA was lost, and therefore Jesus wasn't a true Jew by blood. So it's it's literally the same argument because these people are telling you, well, in AD 70, they were dispersed and they lost their their you know genetic code. Right. You can use that same argument to, to deny Jesus is a Jew, and I think this is where, where logic leads to. Like, if you're going to be so anti-Semitic, 
uh, you're eventually going to try to just get rid of Judaism from Christianity. And right. this is what the Nazis did. Yeah. And by the way, the, like, I'm not talking crazy. I, I have met people online and I even have, um, sadly, a, a Christian that I know for many years is now going down this route and, and he's sympathizing towards his view and telling me, well, you can be a Christian and deny that Jesus is a Jew still. And it's, it's no, you can't because, you know, Jesus is the son of Abraham, son of David. That, that's what it means to be the Messiah. So if people go down this route, which they're going to eventually go to, then that's a false Christ. That's, that's an Aryan Christ, the same Christ that the Nazis believe. And I'm not using this as, as a leftist sense. I'm saying this is what the Nazis did. Sure. And this is just a form of, form of that argumentation. Yeah, it's, it's a big concern. Uh, now, because I, I believe in sola fide so much, let's say someone had never read his Bible and he had just heard the gospel. I suppose that person could theoretically not understand that Jesus is a Jew. But if you bothered to read your Bible at all and say, no, I reject that he's a Jew, to me, that would be indicative of that you're not believing the Jesus of the Bible. You're believing your own Jesus. Because fundamentally, all the Messianic prophecies about Jesus being God and Savior are so interconnected with him being the prophesied descendant of David, of the house of Judah, that if you do separate them, you've made a new Jesus. So therefore, Jesus, for him to be our Savior, he has to be the Messiah of Israel. There's no way around it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't, you you cannot separate Christianity from his Jewish uh, heritage, no matter how much uh, you know you uh, you want to. It's just it's not going to work. And if you do, it's going to be a different religion. Again, I would point you to the Nazis. This is what they did. They got rid of the Old Testament. They said Paul was a heretic. He corrupted Jesus' message. Jesus yeah, wasn't yeah. a Jew. Like like this is just what happens when you go down this route. And I'm not saying they're there yet, but these people who are like this, this is where it leads a, li a little leaven. Paul says leaven's a whole lump. So. 10, maybe a couple of years from now, this is going to be a lot more prevalent. Oh, Jesus wasn't a Jew. And I'm already seeing it all online. And they should be aware that the counter missionaries in Israel, there's counter missionaries who would agree with them for their own purposes. So there's a counter missionary named uh, Tovia Singer on YouTube. And he argues frequently that Paul made up Christianity, that Jesus mm -hmm. is basically uh, a Talmudic rabbi and his words are twisted by the authors of the New Testament. And the, hmm. we've made up a fake Jesus that it's really Paul who's behind it. And so hmm. they agree because they're trying to stop Jews from believing the gospel. So just wow. they should realize who they're siding with. Yeah. Well, that was our, that was our introduction <laughs> to Romans 11. So let's, um, how can we dive into some exegesis so we can just, you know, sure. give a firm defense. Cause that, again, like this is where, where it should be grounded. Uh, we should be exegetical. And if this is true, if it's about Israel for the future, then the, the argument that denies Israel is legitimate and is not God's people is completely refuted by God's holy word. So where do you want to start, Michael? Well, I mean, we can start right at the beginning if you want. We have, I think, might be a rhetorical question. I don't know. Uh, I say then God has not rejected his people. Has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Wow. Yeah. It, it, yeah, you're right. It's a rhetorical question. And what I always like to point out too, God, you know, uh, that phrase, his people. So who, who is that referring to? That has to be by the context Israel. You know, you can say, well, God's people are his church, but Paul's not using it that way. He says his people, and you know, it's not the church because he says he's talking about how, how God, um, asking the rhetorical question, has God rejected his people? So it wouldn't be relevant for Paul to say God right. has God rejected his church because that's, that's not even in the conversation, right? So he Paul Paul literally just here a New Testament he he just called physical national Israel because at the time that Paul wrote this there uh, the nation of Israel still existed then um, his people so that you know this right here off the bat okay now uh, anybody who contradicts and says otherwise. Like, that's it. Like, there really isn't a debate on, on this. Like, this is one of those passages where I just, I, I can't understand the blindness, and I'm not trying to make fun of people. I, I, I think there's there's a, a blindness, whether it's intentional or, or unintentional, but they don't want to accept this. But again, the first verse, his people spoken to national Israel. That's it. There is no obligation. There is no, you know, uh, annulment of the Old Testament promises anymore. Now they're all for the church. No, Paul's calling them his people. Right. So 
some supersessionists, some replacement uh, theologians, as we would say, they will argue, well, okay, fine. Now, some will say, no, it means the body of Christ. Okay, but take them aside. But some others will say, no, well, it's it's there's a remnant at every time. And so there's a remnant here because we're going to, as you read in Romans 11, Paul discusses remnants through Israel's history. There's always been a remnant of believers. And he's now applying that to his present age. Ah, but yes, that proves the point. Because Israel as a nation still exists within the believing remnant. And then it anticipates that further Jews will be saved into the future in a future remnant as a nation, because there won't be many of them left in the in the future at this time. So that actually supports the argument that we're, ta we're talking about Israel here, the descendants of Jacob. We're not using the term or chosen people to refer here to followers of Jesus, which let me say quickly, are people saved by the blood of the lamb, the ultimate true people of God? Yes. But when we say people of God or chosen people, you've just got to follow the context of what's being discussed. You know, if I asked someone in my congregation at the beginning of church, can you go please shut the door? There's wind blowing in. And I, I chose Sam. I don't have a member named Sam, so it's safe. <laughs> and he got up and shut the door. And I said, he was chosen to do that. Does that mean that he is superior to everyone else in the congregation? No, he's just chosen to do this thing. And so we shouldn't be upset that Israel is called this. They're just chosen as a vehicle for God's will. This doesn't mean they have eternal life. They have to trust in Jesus for that. Yeah, and you go back to Romans 9, which you says, most commentators will agree that Romans 9 through 11 is a unit. Yes. God has the right to, to choose who he wants. So God wants to say that Israel is his people and uh, out of all the nations, which is what he said, like Deuteronomy talks about how he chose them because he loved them, then he has the right to. He can love who he wants and choose who he wants. And really, you know, we don't get, you know, the potter can't say, or the clay can't say to the potter, what are you doing? Right. God God has that right, uh, you know, to do that. But, you know, um, it's it's interesting too, because uh, we have to realize like, 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 why is Paul asking this this question? Like, like who, who is he arguing with? Because this is what's going on. There's an interlocutor that, that he's dealing with and, and he's using um, to, you know, that, I guess, uh, what is it? The, the narrative, like, you know, there's a person in front of you that, that he's arguing with yeah, to, yeah. to drive the point home and teach it because the question going on in his time was, well, Paul, and which is the same, you know, same exact objection that we're dealing with today is, Israel rejected their Messiah as a whole. So then doesn't that mean that therefore God has rejected them, not not only as a whole, but also forever? And so Paul Paul is literally answering this objection that we deal with today, the claim, Israel doesn't believe in Christ, therefore they're not his people. And so Paul is asking these people, he's engaging with his argument, has, has this actually happened? Has God actually abandoned them? And then he says, may it never be, and then we see in verse 2, the 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 restatement again god has not and, and now it's not even rhetorical anymore in verse two it's just a proposition god has not rejected who his people whom he foreknew there we go again his people it's the same his people from verse one and then he goes into um you know verse uh you know verses two through i think seven where he talks about the present situation of israel right and and you're right to mention because i just read sam storm's interpretation of this and he tries to argue, well, look, Paul isn't talking about the future. He's talking about in relevance to the present and to say this isn't a future prophecy. It's just saying that God has chosen elect Israelites to be saved. And um, it works for a little bit. But then yeah, as you mentioned, to too, as, as, <laughs> yeah, like it, uh, so he's right. So Paul uses his present day as an example, as proof to support his thesis that God hasn't rejected his people. Well, why not Paul or how not Paul? Because God is still saving Jews, and He even references Himself as one of them, and how there's a present, rem you know, remnant. So Paul, Paul is using uh, the present experience to show, even at this present time, God has saved Israelites. But as you said too, if you keep reading, people like Sam Storms who wanted to say, well, that's only about the present, and it's it's not about the future. It doesn't work because then he goes on to extend this far out and you know down down the road and how far down the road well it, you know we'll it will eventually lead to the return of Christ right so their their problem almost always and I know we're trying to do some a little bit of verse by verse but verse 26 is such a big problem for them that at that point they have to interpret all Israel as somehow all the body of Christ so they can play with it until then but if they cave on that being national Israel then 
they've just lost the argument. So at that point, they almost always have to say that's the body of Christ by that passage. But the idea is that's the final remnant. Yeah. I don't even think they have to go down that route. Like if you're a non-millennialist, like it shouldn't be a problem affirming this, even if you're yeah. a historical premillennialist, right. like, you right. don't even have to go down that route actually. Like again, and I would you know highlight the historic post mill position was when Romans 11 would be fulfilled, this would inaugurate the, the millennial kingdom. Yes. Why do they believe that? And, and some, some people too, I think it was um, Ian Murray. I want to say, I, I believe that name uh, is correct. His last name is Murray, but he's a post millennialist. And he talked about how um, is there any exegetical proof in the Bible for a future revival, you know, to support the the post mill thesis? And he says if there's one passage, it's Romans 11, which again, this is why the historical premillennialists were so firm on this because they believe it's national Israel, as we'll see very shortly. This is going to uh, result in the world being resurrected, like life from the dead, Paul says, and that and that's why. Thousands of Protestants, even even if not dispensationalists, they still still affirm this. And I just wish I wish that people would uh, would know their history more, honestly. Especially the you know the post millennials who are really adamant about this. I wish that they would just study their history a little bit more and realize they would even disagree with you. Like you're not even the classical version of what you think is historic Protestant eschatology in relation to post millennialism. Right. They really have a very radical view, and it, yeah, it's sort of amazing because. We have people like like Spurgeon, J.C. Ryle, or the Mather brothers who believe that Israel would, the people would be brought back to the land based on scripture alone. They believed the Jewish people would be brought back to the land. And now that they actually are, you're seeing a lot of people who say that they like those men who all the more deny that they're supposed to be in the land, even though they're actually there. So it's, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. We can just go into uh, verse 11 and, sure. and 12 because you know, Paul talks about the further, um, you know, the present era. And then he says in verse 11, I say then they, now this is important to, to, to know who are the they's that Paul is using. Right. This is this is really key and a real defeater to the opposite position that, that says it isn't Israel. Uh, I say then verse 11, they, Israel, Again, identify the the they's. They did not stumble so as to fall, did they? Now, remember, the preterists will agree with us. Yes. The postmen, a lot of Amils will agree with us that that the they stumbling is physical Israel. Okay, so let's follow these days through. But by their, and now you sw uh, switch into the plural, their uh, possessive, their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. So Paul's saying. Um, you know, God, God has extended his offer to the Gentiles because, you know, the Israelites didn't accept it. And that's, and, and there's some benefit to that. Like I'm a Gentile, yeah. Gentiles are non-Jews. Are yes. you Gentile too? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm Scottish and Irish. So about as Gentile as you can get. There you go. <laughs> so because of that, there's a benefit. Okay. So now let's go into verse 12 and this, and this is another defeater. Now, if there are there we go again, their possessive, Israel, transgression, be riches for the world, and their, same their, from, from the first their, yes. their failure be riches for the Gentiles, contrasting Israel with the Gentiles. Listen to this last phrase, verse 12. How much more will their fulfillment be? So as I said, follow the, pay attention to the they and follow the theirs. Yes. It's, it's Israel, Israel, Israel. So this this demands by exegesis that this is national Israel, and there's no there, there is no way around this, and that's why I said this is like home base. This is the defeater. It shouldn't even be like uh, I, I generally just feel like like what are we even arguing here, guys? Like like I don't know how much clearer Paul could be. Right, and, and I should also add that Romans eleven eleven. I, first off, I think it's it might be the most critical verse in understanding this chapter. Because I believe Paul is alluding to Deuteronomy 32, 21 in the Song of Moses. Uh, and that passage, well, let, let me get it because it's, okay. It's Deuteronomy 32. 32, 21. And let me give the setup before I read this. This is part of the Song of Moses. Moses is soon going to go to Mount Nebo and he's going to see the promised land and he's going to die. And he's giving some final instruction to Israel. And you know what's a good way to make people remember things? You sing it. So he sings a song of prophecy about the future of the nation. And he talks about they're going to follow false gods who are really demons. And they're going to fall into great sin. They're going to be driven out of the land. And then he says, verse 32, 21, 
They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke mm. them to anger with a foolish nation. Now in the context, foolish nation means at his time, a people group who do not know Yahweh, the true God of Abraham. They don't know him. They're foolish. So he's going to make Israel jealous with, at his day, unbelievers. So the idea is at some point, another nation will know Yahweh. Another nation will know our God, and we will not. And he will use them to make us jealous. And we see that. We see that right now because if we say, if you go to Israel and start talking about how you follow Mashiach, you believe in the Messiah, they're going to go, Mashiach, that's our guy. You can't take him. There, there's a sense of uh, provoking jealousy there. Yes, he was promised to you, but you don't obey him. So you become jealous now. So in that sense, the church is this nation, the body of Christ, who now trusts in the God of Abraham through his only begotten son, Jesus. We know him. And so we can provoke unbelieving Israel to jealousy. And according to Paul, that is one of the roles of the body of Christ. It was one of our roles to get Jews saved by knowing the Jewish Messiah. And I don't think it helps by insulting Jews or saying that no covenant promises apply to them, which saying that to them would be like saying, hey, don't believe large portions of the scripture. And that's just too hard of a pill for them to swallow. So we're not helping by being so uh, hateful and aggressive toward them. And this, mm -hmm. I, I really do believe Paul is referring to Song of Moses here and, and uh, integrating it into his argument. And it's, uh, and if that's true, if he's, if he's referring to the Song of Moses, again, it's a slam dunk that this is not the body of Christ. And fundamentally, let me ask you this, Lucas. How is it possible if the church, if the body of Christ and Israel is the same thing in Romans 11, are, am I supposed to make myself jealous? The church makes ourselves jealous so we can come to salvation, even though we're saved. It doesn't, it starts to fall apart. There, there's too much of a contrast going on here. Like Paul is clearly talking about believers and unbelievers here, right? So, somebody in this group that he's talking about making jealous, somebody doesn't believe Christ. Is it the person who we're trying to make jealous so they will believe Christ? Right, right. And, and it's very interesting, Michael, too, because people, uh, so one, uh, one of my, um, one of my f Christian friends who has fallen for this lately, sadly, and I'm not saying this to, to mock him, um, I won't say his name. But he, but he called me, um, you know, I was called some, uh, some words and some of the words that I was called was, uh, you know, simp for Jews, like I'm being a simp for Jews. And so like, I would want to ask people like this because, you know, that's common rhetoric. So it's not just coming from him. Like he's just, you know, regurgitating what people have said. Yeah. W would you say that to Paul in verse 11 of Romans, uh, of Romans 11, 11, but there's transgression. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Right. So is is Paul now being a Zionist and and they use Zionist to say oh you just you know Zionism is this you know it's like systemic racism for 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 you know the woke left right um, okay. systemic racism is a big bad boogeyman Zionism is a big bad boogeyman you're just a Zionist well you know and like seriously take a step back here if if you're dealing with Paul and and, and face to face and he told you this would you say you're a dispensationalist Paul you're a Zionist Paul he's literally saying. Why did so? Uh, why did salvation come to us to make them again? Who's the who's the they? Who's the them? It's Israel to make them jealous. So it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they mock at us. It doesn't matter what names and slurs and accusations. This is what Paul has said. And by the way, Paul himself was was a Jew. So you know, it, it's it's more irony, right? right? Jesus was a Jew. His apostles were a Jew. Uh, you know, the Old Testament prophets were Jews. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm not, and this isn't me, you know, be, being uh, simping for the Jews or trying to say that I don't love the church and we shouldn't love the church and we should just cave it to sin. Sure. No, it's just it's just affirming what what's in the Word of God. Like I don't know what's the problem here. Right. Why don't we just try to, to the extent we can, why don't we try to take on God's perspective and just align ourselves with His purposes and get over ourselves? And I think when you do that, you're okay saying God chose this people group. And it's, look, I know we're, at, we're in Romans 11, but quickly, okay, Ezekiel 36, he talks about, the Lord says he's going to bring the Israelites, the Jews back into the Holy Land in disbelief, in a state of essentially atheism. And then he goes out of his way to go, not because anything you did, it has nothing to do with you, you're sinners, you disobey me, 
But you know what? My name's associated with you. So out of grace, I'm going to bring you back into the Holy Land anyway. So the nations will know who I am. And so God sees himself aligned with the Jewish people, even if they don't. And this is about just honoring our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and trying to align ourselves with what he thinks is best. And he's revealed what he thinks in his word through a plain, literal hermeneutic, a normal reading. Just read it for what it says in context. Yeah, amen. And, th- and, and, and just going down to verse 15, uh, Romans 11, this is why, again, I'm really going to harp on this. Th- this is why classical post-millennialists believe the millennial will come, because look at what Paul says in verse 15, Romans 11. For if there, and, there, and, and again, there's the there again. This is national Israel. For if their rejection be the, 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 re- the reconciliation of the world, what will their, again, same their acceptance be, but life from the dead? And so that's why, again, the the, the, the people like Thomas Koch, um, Adam Clark, ton, tons of these commentators would agree that th- when this would happen, when this would take place, the Millennial Kingdom would be inaugurated. There was a there was a disagreement on the timing. That's why they were post mills, not pre mills. Sure. But both post mills and pre mills agreed. Yeah, this is national Israel. It's what it's talking about, and this and and this is why. And so it's it's worth to take a step back. Like we have a novel in in interpretation with preterism now we don't want to accept this it's it's worth the time for you to to, to consider well why am i reject why do i have a different view what what am i not seeing what did what am i getting wrong about this text is it a system that i'm committed to and not an exegesis because the exegesis our theology has to be exegetical and if we walk through romans 11 we're just seeing this over and over again like we can just stop here like it, like it's already done like i said you go to right. verse one yeah it's done you go to verse 11 12 uh, 15, like it's national Israel, like case, case closed, like something's, you know, something's wrong here for us to say, to say otherwise. Right. Exactly. I, I just can't be that inconsistent in my own mind. All human beings, we hold ideas that are inconsistent with one another. That's our nature, but I can't do it to that degree. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'll just have to believe it's uh, actually referring to the descendants of Jacob. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I do want to get into, um, Am I moving too fast, by the way? Um, I think no, I no, 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 no. Okay. You should come on my Bible studies in my church. They're all over the place. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I love discussion, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're great to have it with, you know, uh, so far. So, you know, I'm enjoying this. Um, it's a great question to ask, though. Okay, so what you know, what does this mean for modern people? And by the way, um, I do want to deal with after this, um, if this has already been fulfilled in the first century, because some people are arguing that now, too. But for now, let's just stick with uh, application because if we go to verse 18, Paul gives a prescription for how Christians should treat national Israel. And so this comes down to some questions today that, that are being discussed. Like, should we be, should America be a, uh, an ally to them? Should Christians to support the political state of Israel? So here, uh, here's the application that Paul gives in verse 18. To Christians, and and this is binding, by the way, on Christians. This is how we should treat Israel. Whether you know we can disagree if we should be allies, or if we or if we want to support everything that that they, they as a political state do. Sure. This is what Paul says. Regardless, this is a a ought for Christians. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. Speaking of Israel, but if you are arrogant, remember that it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So that's how Paul says we shouldn't be arrogant towards them, and a lot of people. They're, you know, they're arrogant because, oh, they're evil. They rejected the Messiah. Yeah. I'm, I'm the special people of God now, not them. <laughs> Paul says you're being arrogant. Yes. And I want to read I want to read a note from John Wesley, who, again, like classical Protestant, believe this is national Israel. And his note on verse 18 of this verse, he says, boast not against the branches. And, and listen to this. Do not they do this who despise the Jews? Now, some people say, well, I don't despise the Jews, but then John Wesley says this, or deny their future conversion. So according to John Wesley, not a dispensationalist, that's why I say this is not a dispensationalist argument. Sure. Uh, Wesleyan should have this attitude. Paul's saying, do not be arrogant. And that's in relation to not only despising the Jews, but denying their future conversion. So if I'm going to deny their future conversion, John Wesley says, you're breaking this command. Do not be arrogant. And that's not me saying that. Lucas isn't saying this. This is John Wesley. You can look it up online for free. John Wesley notes in the Bible in Romans 11, verse 18. This is what he says. Not a dispensationalist. So so, so, so we can't even bring into this argument, oh, that's dispensationalism. So John Wesley wasn't a dispensationalist. What's your response to him? Right. 
and, and, and it, yeah, exactly. And, and just the picture of it, if, if natural olive branches are ripped off of this illustration of an olive tree and we Gentiles are called wild olives, we get to be grafted into this um, commonwealth of Israel that the covenant promises, especially the new covenant, because that's really given to the Jews, but we enter into it by blood of the, by blood of the lamb, then how could it possibly be? Why would there be two different kinds of branches if it's all just one thing, this one monolithic thing? You wouldn't see branches removed. And then, of course, we anticipate them coming back in. So the idea that, oh, forget those old branches. I'm glad they're ripped off. That's arrogance because we grew from another tree and now we're, we are have been grafted into this olive tree and we're getting nutrients from the original, sorry to say it, Jewish olive tree. <laughs> I'm not sorry to say it. And so why are we erring into that? That we're, all the promises are made through the Jewish people, through the children of Jacob, and that we get to benefit from that because as Jesus himself said, salvation is from the Jews. So mm. sorry he said that, but uh, it's, a, it's just a fact. Yeah, John 4.22, which, yes. uh, by the way, I, I recently found out the Nazis had, had their own versions of the Bible, and they changed that. I forget what they changed that to, but they changed multiple verses. I did not and, know that. Um, that fascinating. Yeah, they changed salvation is from the Jews. I totally forget what they changed it to, but it it was to the interpretation where it uh, it it just wasn't what it was totally what Christ did not say. Right. Christ said salvation is from the Jews, and they changed that to get rid of the Jewishness of it. Um, but you know, and also too, so um, if you go on though, it's even more uh, application for the Christian too, and more irony for the people who don't want to accept this. Paul says. In verse 20 or verse 19, he goes, you will say then. So now he's engaging with the interlocutor again. You will say then branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And he goes in verse verse 20, quite right. They, there's that they again, were broken off by their unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. Well, why is he saying this? Well, verse 21, for God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. And then he goes in verse um, 22, Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell. Severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And so Paul, you know, Paul is saying, hey, if you're going to mock the Jews and be arrogant towards them because they were broken off by faith, well, guess what, pal? So can you. You know, God's going to cut you off as well. Right. right. So what that means is both Jew and Gentile, like Paul said, are, are sinners, and it's only by faith in Jesus Christ that we're saved. And that's not a reason to boast in ourselves, but in the cross of Christ. Right. Amen. Uh, it's there's this idea that look at how Israel sinned throughout their history. Well, you know what? If my ancestor, my oldest ancestor, his name is Duncan Irvin from the 12th century Highlands of Scotland. It's my, my oldest one on record. Let's say he was chosen as the patriarch of God's people. I am quite confident my ancestors have been running around in kilts worshiping Baal by the end of a couple of years. So no other race is any better than the Jews. This idea that we would have done better is just nonsense. The, pro the point is, I think they had the best chance because they descended from Abraham and they, they still couldn't do it without the Messiah. Yeah. Well, Paul says that too, right? Like they had, you know, all, uh, what did he say in, in, in verse uh, or chapter nine? He goes, you know, he talked about all the covenant promises, like basically saying like, you know, exactly what you're saying. Like they had all these odds stacking up against them where it's like, if anybody was going to make it, it was going to be the Jews. Right. These were going to be the people and why? Because they have the promises, the covenants of, and the law of God. Yes. So, you, you know, like you would bet your money uh, pre-Christ, man, who's, who's going to be, who's the closest to being saved? Well, it's going to be the Jews. And you would see the reason for that. Why? Because God chose them and only them among the nations. Yes. Yeah. Amen. So now we're in the, uh, we can, when the final verses, um, almost, because he goes now to verse 23, uh, they also, they do not continue their unbelief will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So so Israelites, Jews can be saved still to this day. Right. And then the, the really the the big future verse, because Romans 11 is, is a prophetic text. Yes, yes. So verse 25, he goes, for I do not want you to, you to be uninformed of this mystery. And this is more application for the Christians. Paul is saying, I don't want you to be, brethren, I don't want you to be uninformed. So so for my fellow Christians today, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to fall into the same mistake that Paul was dealing with. And, and Paul said, I want you to know this. He goes in verse 25, lest you be wise in your own estimation. Estimation, I can't say that right. <laughs> that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. 
okay, so so the, the, there is a judgment on Israel. It's a partial hardening, but it's partial. And so when does this partial hardening end? He says at the end of verse 25, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then verse 26, and thus all Israel will be saved. Yes. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will move on godliness from Jacob. And then verse 27, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So is this, uh, Michael, what do you think? Is this future? Is this past? Is, is this present? Uh, yeah, I'd say all three because we're in this current age of the Gentiles where more Gentiles are getting saved than Jewish people. And I take partial hardening. Is it, is it a sort of spiritual hardening where God is willing it? We could look at it that way if we want. But I think just practically that Jewish people who don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, they have children and they raise them not to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So sometimes nations, they're almost given unto their own sin and it becomes generational, not because God is actively punishing those subsequent generations, just but just because how their parents lived, it's harder for them to come to faith out of that. Especially, if, I, I, find, I find evangelizing to atheist Jews far easier than religious Jews. It's just to make a point mm. out of that. So I, I think... The idea is this age that Paul calls a mystery, which means it wasn't clear in the New Testament. It might have been referred to, but it wasn't some clear prophecy. The current age we're in between first and second coming is not exactly the same as the age of the Gentiles, but there's a lot of Venn overlap. They're almost the same. There's a little sliver of, we could argue Daniel and everything else. But the idea is at a certain point, God has a certain number of Gentiles that he knows from outside of time will come to salvation. And on that day when that last Gentile is saved, he will re-divert his attention to national Israel. There's a lot of prophecies that go into this and it will lead to them believing as a nation. So this is an Old Testament reference. So then all Israel will be saved. Who's that referring to? Well, he's diverting his attention back away from the Gentiles to the Jews again. So it's clearly referring to a generation of Jews at some future date because he's already dealing with us as it is right now in the current age. Yeah. And, and verse 27, I really like to point out, he goes, and this is my covenant with them. And he's referring to like, um, like uh, I have a cross-reference Bible and, and it shows me the verse, Jeremiah 31, which is the yes. new covenant. So Paul is saying the reason why God is going to do this, because this is the covenant he made with them. Right. And so I said, Romans 11 is, is, you know, Paul's not teaching anything new. He's just saying, this is what was written beforehand. And I also, you know, that's why I, um, I think this is consistent with premillennialism in verse 26, it goes, the, the deliverer will come from Zion. I believe that that coming there is future because the context is future of national Israel. Right. And that, yeah, that's uh, I believe that's Isaiah 59, 20. So that's, that's the divine Messiah coming to save Israel from some future great persecution by the nations. And that really yeah. fits so well with other prophecies of the return of the Messiah. So the idea is he will come and personally save them because they will believe on him, which of course we see in the famous Zechariah chapter 12, uh, verse 10 specifically. Yeah, definitely. And like I said that, you know, uh, earlier, just, you know, to the viewers, maybe go, go back and just read Zechariah 12 through 14. Yeah. Like that's a promise, a, a promise and a prophecy about Israel, like what's going to happen in the end times. It fits exactly uh, consistently with Romans 11, Revelation 19 and 20. It's, it's just this whole pattern that's just consistently taught. Um, and, and then we go into the verse you know, um, 28, for the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies, to be speaking of Israel, they're partially hardened if they're not believing. For your sake, but the standpoint of God's choice, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. And so it's important that we get this right. Paul wanted people to know this. He wrote a whole chapter to it. Christians were being arrogant. And I think that Christians are are doing this once more, unfortunately, and falling, to, falling into the same era. And it's it's really taken place and it's up and it's it's, it's grabbing a lot of uh, young men, I feel like, too, by, by the throats and bringing them into this false eschatology. Yes, it, it sort of makes... There's a temptation where people will feel superior to others because they've realized something that you haven't, um, even if it's false. And people fall into that in all sorts of different ways. But I think it's manifesting it now with the new generation. We're saying, I, I know better than my Christian grandparents and my Christian parents because I see this thing that they don't, even though it's wrong. Yeah, Sort of a rejection of uh, evangelical tradition. What would you um, just include, uh, you know, one of the last things, um, you know, before we close, 
Have you heard of, heard of these this uh, radical preterist interpretation where they want to say this was fulfilled in the first century, Romans eleven? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you, um, in a nutshell, because I recently have just heard, uh, heard of that. Um, I haven't really read anything like that that argues for a first century fulfillment. To me, it's you know really radical for one. Um, but do you like do you know that argument like in a nutshell? So I I don't know the specifics, so I I don't want to you know, guess on how it would work. But my understanding is uh, among those who actually do want to say, fine, this is national Israel because they, they just can't deal with it. Otherwise, my understanding is they, that in the late sixties, uh, a final remnant of people believe that Jesus is the Messiah before the temple's destroyed. And then all this other okay. stuff is just imagery of his coming in the clouds. It's really judgment. It's not really his return. And it sort of, it gets, um, it gets all turned into metaphors and non-literal interpretations. So wish okay. I had a better argument for it, but it's hard for me to argue those uh, positions. No, you know what? Uh, that sounds consistent with, with what I heard too, is a, exactly that because, you know, again, um, the evidence is so clear. This is, this is national Israel. Cause even in Paul's time, when he was writing this, this wasn't post 70 AD. Yeah. This was when Israel was a nation and they didn't become a nation again until 1948. So, so this was national Israel which is why it also applies to national Israel in the future. But, you know, they want to go down that route. Okay, I'll, I'll grant you that, that this is national Israel, but this is already fulfilled. Right, right. But the big problem I have with it is if you look at verse 15 again, for if the rejection will be the reconciliation of the world, what would the acceptance be but life from the dead? And so if there are post mills, which every person who's used his argument to say first century fulfillment is a post mill, I want to ask him, well, so did, did, you know, was there a Christian utopian in golden age in post 70 AD then? Because there should have been. And the classical post millennialists understood this first to be teaching that. Like, like, like what happened to the world when is when this was fulfilled in first century AD? And then somehow, and why in the world then did we all just miss miss this, including first century Christians? Uh, Lucas, because it's just part of it's just one thing that has to happen. Other stuff has to happen. And we'll know yeah. it's done at some future time. And then we'll, we'll know it's done when Jesus returns, I guess. <laughs> I feel like it's kind of like evolution where there's so many uh, escape theories to uphold it. It's like, they don't just have the big bang. They have the inflation theory because without the inflation theory, theory, the big bang doesn't work. And they, you know, they interject all these other things and all these explanations. And like, they're just stacking, they're stacking their cards because right. the deck is against them, unfortunately, because they know that, the, or they don't want to, Go down this route of what what Paul was saying, and and believe me, you know, you know, I said this before. Uh, they would accuse Paul of being a dispensationalist and you know, simping for Jews and not loving the church and neglecting the church. And Paul was a Zionist. I think Paul was dealing with these same kind of people in his day, and that's why these objections are are similar. Like the these are the same objections. Like you, you know, like I don't know how much again. Like I don't know how much clearer the, uh, this can be. And if somebody just wants to not accept this, where it's like, well, I. Unfortunately, I don't know what else to, to teach you because I think this is the clearest passage on this topic. <clears throat> right. And, and with this reference to uh, Jeremiah 31 um, in the New Covenant, it I think this, uh, I have this passage, if you don't mind if I read it, from Jeremiah 31, yeah, 35 to 37, because this passage piggybacks on the referred to passage. And so this gives us some clarity. This is Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves were. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Now, this is a fancy argument that's called reductio ad absurdum. And that means that if the events described happen, then they will be absurd, which sort of proves the opposite, which means the natural order of creation is not going to unravel, which means God will not abandon his people Israel. And I realize that some people go, oh, that means the church there. Well, then why is he talking about for all that they've done, all their evil, all their sins? It's in the context. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is in the context of Babylonian captivity, looking forward to the future. So 
this idea that this secretly means the church means that God is lying. Because if I read Jeremiah when he wrote this, and I was a Jew in Babylon, I would sit there and go, wow. I would never, it would never occur to me to go, you know what, though? This actually applies to a future group of Gentiles who don't currently know Yahweh, not me. It would never occur to me that's what it means, which means there's a sense in which God would have deceived the original audience. And he doesn't do that. He speaks as plainly as possible for us to understand it. So that would be like if I wrote a contract to sell you my car, Lucas, and I, I said it was a Ferrari. And you came and you you came to buy it and go, hey, this is, an, this is a Subaru Outback. This isn't a Ferrari. <laughs> I would go, listen, Lucas, I'm sorry that you don't consider it a Ferrari. I'm the owner of the car and I get to determine what it means. And yeah. when we said, when we made the agreement, it might have meant that. But, uh, you know, I define things based on my will and I don't tell you what that what the words mean. Well, you'd say I was a liar. And that's how that's what we make God when we replace Israel with church in passages like this. And, and let's even grant the people who want to argue with this uh, New Testament priority or apostolic interpretation. Okay, Romans 11 proves that Paul understood this to be national Israel. Sure. He quotes from the New Covenant. So, like, the, like there's no escaping, you know, whether you go to Old Testament, New Testament, there is no, you know, again, there's just no escaping this. Like, this is what, just what it is. And, you know, uh, again, you know, fortunately, if if people are just so anti-Semitic and just have a hatred for the Jews, and again, I'm not using this like, like uh, you know, the left does to say that's just somebody who disagrees with them. No, I mean, actually going on, or at the very least, doesn't say they don't hate the Jews. Sure. Paul says, you're, you know, you're being arrogant towards them in some way. He doesn't want you to be ill-informed. He doesn't want you to be wise in your own eyes. He doesn't want you to be puffed up with pride because they're, they're the evil, you know, ones who rejected Christ and you accepted him. Again, you know, the, you know, this is all just Romans eleven, Scripture, Jeremiah thirty one, and this, you know, and ultimately, what is this? Well, this is God's holy, this is God's breathed out holy word. That's it. That's infallible and that's authoritative above all. And you don't have to agree with the Israeli government <laughs> to believe yes, Romans you, eleven. You can exactly <laughs> uh, when when uh, when BB he mandated shots during the event. I thought I was like, that's, that's immoral. You shouldn't mandate anything. I, I totally disagreed with that. Um, I still love the nation of Israel because of God's purposes, but I don't agree with everything. Every Jewish person does. <laughs> of course not. They're human beings. That has nothing to do with it though. I just want to trust in God's promises. Yeah. And exactly. And people, you know, again, people can't think categorically. They think, this, you know, saying this means, oh, so you, you know, affirm all their sin and you, and you just, you know, give them a pass. No, right. any more than like an example I give, I'm a patriot for America, but it doesn't mean I side with LGBT and grooming. I hate that. Right. I think it's wicked and evil. Absolutely. So why do you, you know, why is it then when I say this about Israel, oh, you're just siding with them, you know, you're a Zionist. Well, why, why can't I say what Paul says for the sake of the gospel, their enemies, but for the sake of the patriarchs, their beloved. Why can't I affirm both why can't you think categorically is, is a real issue and i feel like if, if people can just you know get rid of that presupposition maybe we can actually deal with romans 11 and what it's talking about amen and i got bad news for some of them when jesus returns and reigns from jerusalem they're going to find out what zionist is and they may not like it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know jesus is going to be a monarch he's going to rule them with a rod of iron right and it's going to be from Jerusalem. He's going to fulfill those promises. And on that day, you know, there's going to be no preterism that day. There's going to be no replacement theologian. There's going to be no uh, neo-Nazi going on or any kind of uh, anti-Semitism going on. And it's going to be case closed. And, and that's it. And, and, it, and it's better to be in the position where we affirm this rather than reject it. Because when Christ comes, uh, you know, we're not going to be ashamed in, in that sense that is coming, uh, being a person who just denied all this. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well said. Amen. Well, that was a fantastic episode. I feel like uh, we really got to cover us, and I'm hoping that people can really get a firm grasp and get some exegetical arguments going on in this um, in this passage. Any any final thoughts? Yeah, I just just to um, go off what you're saying. Yeah, I just encourage people uh, read this and just ask yourself how would the original audience have taken this who read this, because that's who Paul's writing to. Just always ask yourself that, and that's that's usually a good starting point. Don't go in based on necessarily your church traditions and try to and uh, read it through a lens. Just read it for what it says. Yep. Amen. I'll put both your books in the description of this video for them to go uh, check it out. Like I said, I, I read um, his one book, 1000 Years with Jesus. Uh, that was great. And he has a new book, The Divine Message as well. 
And to the viewers, if you can please like this video, it helps get the algorithm out, share it as well, subscribe. And until next time, take care. Thanks for tuning in and God bless. Take care. Thank you.